It's the Queen City Music Podcast. The podcast devoted to the local music scene in Charlotte, North Carolina. Here's your host, Matthew Ablin. Hello and welcome to episode four of the Queen City Music Podcast. I'm excited about this month's episode because it pertains to a subject that I have become increasingly interested in the last several years. And that subject is audio recording. If you did not know, many musicians and non-musicians are becoming amateur audio engineers and have home recording studios or a laptop with recording software such as Pro Tools or Cubase. Many amateurs also struggle to make the most of their equipment and take their music to the next level by producing high-quality, professional-sounding recordings. At least, I know that that had become the case for me. Last summer, a friend told me about an audio recording class he was taking at Central Piedmont Community College. It's part of their corporate and continuing education program. He was pretty impressed by the quality of the instruction and how affordable the classes were. Needless to say, I read up on it and this past fall enrolled in Audio One, which is the first class in the sequence. I learned a great deal and plan to continue taking the sequence of classes. Well, what does this all have to do with this month's episode of the Queen City Music Podcast? Well, today I have Dan Guerreri, who is one of the instructors in the audio engineering program at CPCC, here with me. Hi, Dan. How are you today? Good. How are you? Very good. Thank you for taking, taking on, uh, coming on the podcast. I really appreciate it. Oh, it's my pleasure. So let's, let's get into it. You are one of the instructors over at CPCC, Central Piedmont Community College, teaching audio recording or audio engineering. Right. How long have you been down there? Uh, I've been there about six semesters now, um, quite a while. Okay. And the program has expanded since I first came in there. When I, when I first came in, we just had three classes in, in our, our courses. Now we added the fourth to help our students, you know, be more competitive in the world of job seeking. <laughs> well, let's backtrack a little before we start getting into the into the program and talking about that. What's your background with audio recording? Uh, audio recording. I've been in audio recording for close to thirty seven years now. Wow. Um, I started um, when I was twenty, and I made this this jump from being an artist on their side of glass. And I've also have been a studio musician at one point and um, product specialist and product manager for a couple of different manufacturers. But I stayed kind of with one foot in the studio all the time, and I've owned a couple studios myself. Okay. So I've been involved in recording for most of my, most of my adult life. And what, what, what's your background before that? Did, were you a musician before you got into audio recording, or were you always an audiophile? No, I was a, I was a musician uh, first, and someone who was uh, pretty far up the food chain in the record industry, right. gave me a really great piece of advice one point. They said, look, Dan, at some point, you're going to become too old, too bald, or too fat <laughs> to be in front of a stage of people. I've hit two out of the three. I still got my hair, folks. Um, that part didn't go. The rest is all downhill from there. So he gave me that advice and said, you know, look, you got a really good ear for this. You might want to think about jumping on that other side of the glass, you know, at some point to, to help sustain a career in in the music industry mm. so that's been that was a really great valuable piece of information or you know valuable life thing he dropped on me the other one was he says you know if you're in the record industry you, you give up your right to be a fan he said so, <laughs> so he says you're going to run into a lot of famous people he says and you can't be you know trying to get autographs and right. photographs from everybody if you expect to be one of their peers. Yeah, it's quite unprofessional, isn't it? Yeah, so, and, and I, I have friends who have, you know, big names and things like that, and you can watch them when the fans roll in the door, man, their eyes just curl back in their head, and they're going like, <laughs> okay, I'm done, oh my God. So when you got into audio recording, what was the situation like? Because I'm imagining you didn't go to school for, 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 you know, four years, got a degree in audio engineering, and then walked out. No, it was very similar to what, you know, some people are doing today, although there were way fewer schools for it. Um, that was when the schools first began doing this, like, 16 weeks intensive program. So you could take 16 solid weeks and study your butt off for 10 hours a day. Mm -hmm. You know, by the time you're done in 16 weeks, you got, you know, 160 hours of, of intensive study. Then they would boot you out to a studio where you did an internship and you'd have a guy who had been in the, the industry for 20 plus years kind of guide you for that last few steps 
of the process. So a me- basically a mentoring process. Yeah, it's a mentoring it's- process. And, you know, kind of in the recording industry, it's more like a trial by fire. You know, they figure out how, how committed you are to doing it <laughs> by you get to make coffee for the first, you know, four weeks of your internship and go <laughs> so get pizza. So it's kind of like the movies. We were, that does happen. Yeah, it does happen. You know, they're going like, okay, well, you know, and then finally when they dump you in, at least in my case, they toss me in the deep end of the pool. Wow. So my first session was with ad agents sitting in the front couch in front of the console and the the owner of the studio just walked out the door hmm. and just left me there to finish running the session. So, you know, it's it's an interesting thing. We had to have some trust in you if he just left you there. Yeah, and it, you know, it's that kind of trial by fire thing. You either you're going to survive or you don't. Right. Right. And that's, you know, and part of part of what they look at, you know, that I kind of feel sorry for some of the youngsters now because they spend so much time texting. <laughs> that that those people skills are what will pull you through a session. Yeah. You know, that, it, you know, like I call the job like being, you know, a quarter technical, half of it knowing music, and that other quarter, you're a psychologist. People skills. So you have to kind of read the situation that's going on. I mean, you know, we're taking creative people, dumping them in the equivalent of a submarine and locking the door, and sometimes, you know, emotions can ride, can ride kind of high. And how much how much input do you have as as the audio engineer on projects that you might work on, rather than just I'm pushing the button, right. I'm recording what you're doing. As an engineer, I mean that's your job is to push the button. Okay. So your job as an engineer is to make sure that you know things like microphone selection, mm-hmm. with the goal of capturing that guy's sound exactly, is is really the goal. If you have a violin in the studio or an acoustic guitar, your goal is to capture that instrument as faithfully as you can on the recording device. So the um, as an engineer, that's kind of your thing. You you do that. You basically shut up and stay out of the middle of stuff. You know, you don't offer musical opinions unless you're asked, mm-hmm. because usually the guy who has all the musical opinions is either the leader of the band that's producing the session or the producer himself. So a producer will walk into a recording session knowing exactly what they expect to get out of their music, what the band expect for the band. The engineer's job is to help make that vision a reality. Have you straddled uh, or walked on both both sides of the fence? I Do walk you... actually the producer side of the fence way more than the engineer side. Okay. And my skill set was my skill set is kind of a unique skill set because I had been a recording um, a session player, mm-hmm. so I'm you know very familiar with what it, the stresses and kind of weird things that go on as you're recording on the other side of the glass. Right. Plus, I could read music. Plus, I could, you know, fix songs and arrange and do all this other stuff. My skills really lent more to, to producing rather than just sitting and pushing buttons. So for me, a lot of times in a session, if I'm producing and engineering both, the technical side of things will get a little flappy, mm-hmm. you know, because I've always felt like if you took care of the music first, everything else will take care of itself. Right. So, you know, you could have a great track with a couple of little engineering flaws in it, and it's still okay. You know, even if you listen to masters like Steely Dan, you, you'll hear engineering flaws on Steely Dan albums. You'll hear engineering flaws on, on a lot of stuff, but the music itself was awesome. Right. And there's even errors in the music. There's little stuff that's dropped in, mistakes, and they just yeah. left it because they didn't want to redo a take. Or It's part of the feel. Right. You know, if it really feels good and you got such a great feel, you know, why throw the whole thing away just on the off chance that maybe you'll get like that one thing? You know what I mean? Perfect. Like lightning doesn't strike too often in the same place twice. Right. I know I saw this video of, you know, last month of a guy who got struck twice standing in the same place. So I, I think it <laughs> happens, but you know, in the recording studio, not that often. I think, you know, funny enough, you say that I, I remember seeing an interview with Alice Cooper and they were talking to him about recording and using guitar players. And he goes, it's a funny thing about guitar players. They usually get things on the first take. They might take 40 takes in the studio and go, I don't like that, I don't like that. He goes, but whenever I'm behind the glass, I tell the engineer, record this. And they're like, but it's just the first take. He's like, record this. And their first take is usually the best take. And then when they listen back, he goes, that's the one I'm using. Yeah, it's it's funny about guitar players that we, we tend to do that. I think the pressure's off on that first one. Mm-hmm. You got all, and a lot of times it's not just guitar players, it's other musicians as well sure. in the studio. That very first shot, the creative juices are really flowing high. Mm-hmm. You, you're you not stressed out yet because you haven't started to judge what you were doing. So a lot of times that very first take is is magic. And that's, it, well, as a session player, you know, you're kind of, it's kind of beat into your head. Right. You know, time is money. So, you know, if you don't get it on the, the at least the second take, mm-hmm. 
then you know you probably won't be invited back for the next session. <laughs> you want to you want to nail it down a little bit. Yeah, that's uh, yeah, that's kind of it's it's a funny thing about being a session player. You know, it's it's it, they always they kind of expect expect you to come up with something that's magical but they want to do it in a very timely fashion they don't want you to have to take you know seven or seven or eight or nine hours or 150 takes to get the one good one well they're paying you for a service and they and they like like you to accomplish that service yeah and usually they'll just throw a chunk of music at you and go like okay here it is this is what we're doing and a lot of my a lot of my session work was in jingles Mm -hmm. so you know we would we would be hired for that session and then you would have to like crank out you know sometimes a dozen of them in an afternoon. So you get four hours to do a dozen or two dozen different background tracks wow. of jingles where you just have to, you know, literally bash through them. Hmm. But the people that are around you are also really good at doing it. Right. So, you know, you have a group of people that can pretty much think on their feet and, and it, it all seems to mesh. And that's a lot of times, especially commercial sessions like that and production sessions. That's why you see kind of over and over on movies, the same orchestras being used the same studios being used because the players know how to record. Right. And, you know, Roger Waters said, said that about Pink Floyd when it came to Dark Side of the Moon. He said, yeah, we had just gotten to the point where we all knew how to record. And they <laughs> said, so we have gained enough experience in the studio that now recording was something that we knew how to do and had experience with. And I think a lot of bands go through those growing pains where they have to spend some time and get to that level of experience, you know, before they can kind of be in charge of their own, their own destiny. Yeah. It's, I found over the course of my career as a musician and and a professional, everything is, is compartmentalized because it's, it's a different animal. Performing live is a different animal than playing in the studio. Playing in the studio is different than practicing in your bedroom. Practicing in your bedroom is different than sitting down in a lesson and talking to someone and telling them how to do something. But all these things together, of course, you know, make you a better musician, but they're all different and they all require their own unique skills to to be able to grow. Yeah, it does. And you, you got to try to get good at, you know, multiples. So it, it just requires that that focus. You know, that's why a lot of times, you know, they talk about the sophomore slump with albums where right. where the bands come in, they have this great first album, then their second album's not so good. And I kind of started looking at it at one point, I'm going, why is there this thing called a sophomore slump? I mean, you know, it's like bands like Def Leppard didn't have a sophomore slump. Right. And I, the one, the one uh, deciding factor in that was the fact that bands that don't have a sophomore slump have kept their producer from their yeah, first true. album and didn't self-produce it. Right. So, you know, I think that learning curve the first time around, the producer is there. You know, and Joe Elliott said that from, from Def Leppard. He said, yeah, producer's job is to make you better than you really are. So, you know, a good producer can bring a lot out of a band. And we look at bands, you know, like Blondie, who's had the same producer since Parallel Lines. Mm-hmm. Uh, Rush had the same producer throughout their almost entire career. Terry Brown. Terry Brown. Yeah. So those bands that were successful have kind of learned that secret that a good producer can translate what they do live to the tape Mm -hmm. or the recording system, you know, help make that transition, but also act as that extra set of ears to help them, you know, find what fits and what doesn't. Mm -hmm. And a lot of the bands that hit that sophomore slump with their second album after their first successful one are are basically because, you know, they they self-produced. So do you feel that your background as a musician has helped you in, in your audio engineering career? Oh, immensely. Immensely. Yeah. I mean, my goal was, I realized that when I was working in the Jingle House, we had these two guys that were locked back in this back office by themselves with the Sinclair, okay. which was the first big standalone keyboard recording system. And they were cranking out track after track after track after track. And, you know, I said, I said you know what? This is what I want to do. <laughs> but they were like older than me. I was in my early twenties at the time. Right. So, you know, I was like, man, you know, I want to get there. I want to be one of those guys that could create an entire track on my own. So it took a while of like really focusing and, and deciding, Hey, are you going to be like a really super engineer or are you going to be a super musician that knows how to record? Right. And I had to make that choice because we can't be, I mean, there may be some guys out there who can do it, but most of us normal mortals cannot pull off being one of the top 10 recording engineers on the planet right. and one of the top 10 musicians on the planet. Some of us never get to either of those spots. 
So I really had to focus. So what I did was learned an, enough about engineering, you know, that, hey, look, man, I'm fine. I'm like, you know, when I'm in the candy store, I know where the gumballs are and I know where the licorice is. However, I'm not obsessed with, you know, this thing with this knob on it and this thing with that knob on it. And most engineers are, are gearheads. They're the guys that are obsessed with gear. You know, it's like they're the ones that could quote the entire MXR catalog from memory, including all the specs. <laughs> you know, I just was, I was like never kind of one of those guys. I, you know, liked the gear and I understood what it did and what sound it made. But I really never gave a crap what the, what the name on the front of it was. Mm. Um, well, except for guitar amps. I mean, <laughs> guitar amps, I've, I've always been kind of like a Marshall guy and that's how I ended up being a product specialist because I was just, you know, loved loved the Marshall amps. Well, I think a lot of musicians in general are um, <sighs> slaves to what's on the headstock. Yeah, a lot of times we are. Or the name brand. We, you know, it's, you're a Gibson guy, you're a Fender yeah. guy, you're a Marshall guy. Oh, I won't buy this, I won't buy that unless it's it's this. But for me, I tried a lot of other different guitar amps and right. the Marshall kind of sounded like me. So I would, you know, kind of constantly, I mean, you know, I've owned Fender amps and PV amps and oranges and, you know, just a whole garden variety list of things, even right. Mesa Boogies, which are, you know, fine amps. But I just, the sound that came out of them never quite got that same sound right. or that same feedback from me. There's like kind of this weird thing when you play, you know, when you got a Marshall turned up big enough, you know, loud enough to make your pants flap, you play this chord and the amp goes, <gasps> <laughs> it takes this big breath in between when you quit playing. And it just, for me, was always like kind of as much of the noise that made in between was sure. as big of an experience as the noise it made when I was playing on it. <laughs> and so, you know, I, I was was fortunate. I found what was kind of my sound. Right. You know, I was lucky enough and fortunate enough to find something that made my sound kind of regardless of what guitar I dumped into it. Right. So, you know, I consider myself pretty lucky. So at what point did you transition from being a musician? I don't not that you ever stopped being a musician, but let's say more less of a full time performing uh recording player into more of an audio engineering career. Uh, that's a that's a tough one because it was kinda I mean, my first job as a recording engineer, I was still gigging. Okay. So, you know, like for me I always kinda had one foot on both sides of that fence. Okay. Um, probably the, the biggest break I took from being a gigging musician was when, when I was a product specialist. Okay. Cause I just didn't have time to, you know, when you got a road schedule that's six weeks out and two weeks in, how do you keep a band together when you got a road schedule like that? Right. So being a product specialist was, was part of, I think that was when I kind of made the break. And actually when I was in town, I had more time to spend in the studio. Mm -hmm. So that probably was the closest time that that happened. That was a, a way back in 1988. So, you know, now I spend a lot of time. I mean, I do production music right? Um, when I'm not teaching and, you know, occasionally do um, some session work remotely like everybody's doing now. <laughs> <'Cause> it's, <crazy. laughs> it's, it's like I would love to be in a studio you, doing it, but, you know, the, the thing has changed. People are... Yeah, you can make a lot more money that yeah. way. And people are working, you know, from... You know, Southern California, if they're Southern California, they no longer have to have you in Southern California to yeah. to contribute to their album. They can send you the tracks. You can book a studio on your own where you live and do it and send it back. But we're in this much more, it's kind of a cool thing because you can bring people into your project from all over the world if you'd like to. Right. I have a friend who just uh, recorded an EP um, and the guys were from all over the country. I mean, they're, they're A-name players that he... Did he's he himself is just an ordinary guy like myself. He's he's a music teacher, and he's like, you know, I'm going to do this EP. I'm just going to hire all these guys to play. It wasn't as expensive as you think. I mean, some of these guys I'll name drop, but Vinny Apice, who who used to play mm -hmm. with Ronnie James Dio and, and Black Sabbath, and yeah, Vinny and my brother are really good buddies. Okay, and so I think Vinny was only a few hundred dollars, you know, to play on his recording, and he's like, I got Vinny Apice on my recording. He's playing drum man on this track, and then. Uh, so and there's a singer from Sweden. So of course, you know he's sending tracks back and forth across the country, oh, yeah. across the world, to get these guys to play on his recording. And yeah, he spent a couple of bucks, you know, getting these top level players, but he got some top level playing. Yeah, well, it, I mean, you know, when we think about it, and it's it's funny the the guy that that used to be with the Mamas and Papas, um, he said when you're making your album, you have to remember that 
you're making an album that's competing with everything else that's ever been made. Yeah, that's true. So, you know, when you when we make a recording now, it's just not the guys in the rehearsal room down the street. It's just not the guys who's got the rig next door in his, in his bedroom or whatever. I mean, we got some heavy stuff that we're putting albums out against. I mean, think about, you know, things like Sgt. Pepper's or Meat Loves, you know, Meat Loves Bad Out of Hell, which is on, on track this year to sell another million copies. Right. And these albums have gone on like forever and forever and ever. So giving yourself that chance of bringing in, you know, a, a Carmine Irvinia piece or bringing in like a Billy Sheehan to play a bass part or something like that just helps up the, you know, up the quality of your album. I mean, and even if it's guys that nobody's ever heard of who are that kind of player, and we all know these guys, you know, that nobody knows of, but but you're going like, holy cow, this guy is like one of the best musicians I know. It really helps, you know, bring that level of your of your album up. Sure. You know, if you're not capable of managing all the things that need to be managed for, for recording an album, that's when you want to bring in a producer. Right. You know, a producer can manage all of those little bits and, and pieces and, you know, can actually tell you, hey, look, at this point, your drum part's not up to snuff. Let's bring in a drummer, you know, using that drum machine or using the realistic drummer or whatever you're using in software ain't cutting it. Let's bring in a real drummer and drop a real drummer on this project. The interesting thing I find about today with, with this whole process of being able to record remotely or hire people is that it seems to me the world is a lot more open where, one, you can get in contact with these folks because they're on Twitter, they're on Facebook, they have a web page, so you know how to get in contact with them. 20 or 30 years ago, I'm dating myself, yeah. but it, you, I don't know how you even found out who these people were or, or an, uh, an address to write them a letter. Second of all, if they would even play on your recording. Yeah. And now with the world of music changed because of uh, the, just the recording industry and has changed so much, these guys are just trying to make a living. Right. They're not in a top level band anymore that that's on tour, tour uh if they're fortunate they are. Right. But a lot of the guys are not. They're they're going they have five other projects going on at the same time and if they can record a bass part or a guitar part in their hotel room in their downtime and make a couple hundred bucks. They're like that's great. Yeah, it's a plus. Well, Alan Holdsworth had said, you know, for him it was never about fame and fortune. It was always kind of a matter of survival. Yeah. And even after Alan passed, there was a question as to how they were going to cover his final burial expenses. So, and this guy's a legendary musician and was uh, was one of the nicest guys you'd ever want to meet. I mean, just amazingly nice. So it's interesting how people have, you know, because they were so good, they attained a level of fame, but somehow never quite got to that, right. you know, financial freedom that we just seem to think comes instantly with being famous. So, you know, these, there are a lot of guys who are continuing to gig. They're like one gig away from financial disaster. And they're just like the rest of us in the, in the trenches slugging away. Well, you know, I was listening to another podcast. I, I want to get back to recording soon. <laughs> but I was listening to another podcast not too long ago. And they had said something which really kind of s sunk in. From, let's say, sometime in the 1960s, maybe if you want to go back to even the beginning of the 50s, into the 80s, 90s, so maybe a 50-year span in music, that is the golden age of recording where people could record, make a lot of money, yep. tour a lot, sell a lot. And over the history of music, that's not really the case. Yeah. It's a 50-year span. You go back and Mozart was struggling to make a living. Right. Yeah, Alice Cooper had said something at one point, you know, when when I was much younger and when I was like maybe 20 and he says, Oh man, I feel sorry for you kids because you have a hard time making money. And by the time he was like 23, they, they had already become millionaires from yeah. the Alice Cooper tours. So, you know, as, as major record labels figured out how to maximize their cash flow from their assets, which are their artists, the artists themselves have been kind of on the losing end of that battle a little bit. Right. And so, you know, I think the strategy and, you know, now everybody's like waving the flag of independence. Oh, we don't need a label, don't need a label, don't need a label. But at some point in your career to get you from A to B, um, a major label has to, to get your name in every household. And then you can walk away from them and be famous after everybody knows who you are. You know, it's, <laughs> after and, you've made all your money. And, and after, you know, and you look at that as just as maybe a one or two year. You know, here's my one or two year side trip where I'm paying my dues so that I can get away from these idiots and then go out on my own. Right. Um, 
And I mean, you know, nobody needs the Backstreet Boys in sync, you know, experience they had with Lou Pearlman, where Lou made all the money and they made nothing. But, you know, at the same point, you kind of have to plan your career around how are you going to get me, how are you going to get to where you want to be, right. you know, in five or 10 years? And, and you know, my friends always, can, you know, accuse me of being a mercenary. And I'm like, well, you know, I look at things, I try to look at things kind of logically as to, you know, where do I, what do I got to do to get from point A to B? Does it make sense for me to, to sit in somebody else's studio at this point and make close to minimum wage as an engineer? Or can I work out of my own studio and and do better for myself? Right. Does, does that make sense? I no, mean, it, it does know, because it, today as a musician, you are almost, well, I shouldn't say you almost, you are forced to have multiple income streams. Oh, absolutely. You need to be able to play. You need to be able to record. You're being able to do things a lot on your own. I mean, I don't know too many musicians, even if they're just at the local level, they've got their own websites and they're hiring somebody to do it. They've got their own Facebook pages. They're posting stuff. They're the ones calling the bars, yep. trying to get gigs. So you have to know how to do certain things. And recording is just one of those things that you... Yeah, because be you know, part own. of your income stream as a performing musician should be having an EP, right? That goes off the end of the stage to sell, and in the very least, you need to have something on a website right. or a Facebook page that say, "Hey, this is what I sound like." Yeah, because you got to have all of it. I mean, when you look at these like really, really top cover bands, yeah, you know, and you say cover band, and these instantly everybody's going. Like, you know, and holding up the sign of the cross at you because you're evil. <laughs> but a lot of these really top, top level cover bands, if you look at their websites, they not only have song lists, where they're playing, what they're doing, they have videos of themselves, yeah. you know, at a gig, which will make a booking agent or a buyer or someone who's looking for talent much more likely to, to hire them for that gig than somebody Absolutely. that just, you know, I mean, rock musicians, we tend to be the worst of it. We kind of sit, you know, we kind of sit on our butt and expect the universe to recognize our talent and, you know, <laughs> grab us just because we're so much better than the guys next door. Right. But it truly is about getting your name out there. You got to, you got to have a presence. I mean, I'm kind of an enigma. I stay invisible on purpose. And that, that goes back to when I, um, in the 1980s, I ghosted guitar parts right. and a, a ghost and I still ghost projects for people. So a ghost is somebody who comes in, and in my case, I would come in and replay an entire album of rhythm guitar parts for somebody else. The band's already on tour. The album's getting ready to mix. The producer or the mixer doesn't like the sound of the guitars, so I would be hired to come back in and play that entire album hmm. and copy that guy's style with a different sound. Interesting. Now we just, you know, reamp. <laughs> you know, now we don't, now it's, it's not necessary that that position is completely gone because we record differently now. You know, we have right. a dry guitar as if it never went through an amp with a mic or anything on it that's on the computer. You don't like the sound of it? Just plug it back into another guitar amp and call it done. There's no need to bring a guy in to copy what went on. Or use a you know, plug-in. Or use, yeah. <laughs> so it, it's really interesting how things have changed, but you, know, you have to be, you have to understand that, you know, I, I know quite a few other guys who have who kind of work behind the scenes right so being behind the scenes is not bad if you're not hungry for recognition if you you know if, if that's not the important thing for you and for me it's always been kind of about the music mm. not kind of about the music it's really been about the music i mean you know i'm one of those guys that wakes up in the middle of the night humming songs and frantically looking for a piece of paper to write down song lyrics to it you know four o'clock in the morning when i get woken up so you know it's it's just kind of, you know, where your focus is, right. you know, and really good recording engineers, the only thing they think about are like pushing buttons. They're obsessed with that. And I think, you know, probably as far as being just a recording engineer only, that that's kind of a tough spot for me because it's not, you know, it'll pay the bills, but it's not where my passion lies. Right. So you've you've got this background as, as a musician, doing studio work, you've done uh, recording stuff, uh, audio engineering. Uh, what made you get come down to CPCC to to do the program? You said you've been there about six semesters. Yeah, I, and maybe longer. I'd have to ask. You know, I'm I kind of just sort of like one of those guys who never know what day it is. So <laughs> you know, it's, it's it's time goes fast. Yeah, time goes fast, and you know, I'm not one that really ever pays attention to a calendar either. You know, I'm like one of those guys. That if you ask me what time it is, I couldn't tell you unless I looked. Um, 
But what inspired me to do it was I had a mentor of mine who had passed. Okay. And I realized that all of a sudden I started seeing a whole bunch of other guys pass away. And I'm like, you know what, man, I'm one of the old guys. You know, that's a terrible thing to come come to grips with. But I said, you know what, all these things that I learned from them and all these things that I've learned over the years, if I don't share it with somebody else, it's going to be gone. Hmm. You know, and, and the the best way to share it was kind of face-to-face with an interested group of people. I mean, we can do it one or two ways. And yes, I am in the middle of trying to write a book with all this garbage in it. But, you know, the best way to do it is face-to-face with interested people like yourself. Yes, so. uh, for for full disclosure, a friend had was taking the class down at CPCC. And I was talking to him one day because we both record. And he said, man, you've got to go down to CPCC. They had a... Uh, they have a recording class down there. I've started taking it's. It's really good. It's really inf- in. You get a lot of information. It's. It's a. It's a great place to learn. So I said, okay, let me check it out. Some time went by. I didn't have time. It was pretty much about a year later since I. I saw him. I said, you know what? The co- I got a brochure in the mail. I don't know what where it came <laughs> from. I, it just. It appeared. I didn't call. I didn't. I get it in the mail, and I'm like. You got the, gear, there, you got there the gears is. of the universe going and it just landed on you, right? Yeah, so you it came back did. to came back to help you. So one of the things I love about it is that it's affordable. Previously, I think I spoke to you about it. Um I called a different school. I don't even say the name. And they said, No, you have to come in and get a degree. You can't just come oh, in wow. and take the classes. Yeah. I said, What do you mean? I can, I just want to come in and take the classes. I've already got such and such degrees. No, you have to come in and get a degree in, in audio engineering to get in our program. And I said, that's ridiculous. Yeah, that's crazy. And that's part of the reason I decided to, to come down to CPCC. It was like, no, it's continuing education. Yeah. If you're an adult, you can come in, take what you need to take. What? Yeah, and our big thing is personal enrichment. That's, right. that's what you know the school does so well. And whether your personal enrichment happens to be, hey, look, man, I got this really crappy job and I want to get a degree to do something else. Right. You know, that's that will fit the thing. And they're really big on, you know, trying to trying to help people move their lives forward. That's that's a really big part of that whole um, institution, which honestly, you know, I planned on teaching a couple semesters and then deciding whether I was going to get my master's or doctorate and then just kind of, you know, moving on. But I I found that I really like the the environment Mm -hmm. is a very good environment for the students to learn in. And, you know, it's like, I had a two hour commute there one way. So, you know, I'm driving from Winston down here to teach. So, you know, it's not a short trek, but, um, it's, it's about, you know, trying to share that stuff with the other people, you know, trying to share and trying to get this information out that, you know, like I tell my students, I'll, I'll tell you stuff about the record industry that somebody a won't tell you or B doesn't know is going on. And I'm kind of blunt about that because I think it's, it's a hard lesson to learn when you aren't aware of it and suddenly you're dropped in that situation. So I'm, you know, maybe not quite as bad as Steve Albini about it, but (laughs) you know, I try to just kind of, you know, to show you how the cow ate the grass, you know, this is, this is how the industry works. This is how long it's really going to take you to get there. If you're serious about it, you know, there, there are not a lot of secrets to it. Well, that's one thing I really enjoy about the class. I think I spoke to you about is, is that you're dropping in real world, uh, insights into a recording class where you could just sit there and go over, okay, this is how reflect reflective sound works, and this is the uh, this is this is how you push this button. This is how this works. All you have to do, but it's like, no, this is how the business works. If you want to do this, this is how your career is going to have to. Which ultimately, you know, you're going to leave. And, you know, that's the second tier of Audio One. That's that's right. what we cover. This is how reflected sound works. Here's the formula to do it. But that first class, you know, the thing I found, and a lot of studio owners will tell you this, that that just makes them crazy beyond description are people that are green. They don't know anything about the industry at all in which they want to work in. Mm-hmm. And especially now after we've had, you know, almost two decades of home recording madness, that people have spent all their time locked in a little room in front of a computer screen, and they're still not aware of how how everything interrelates to each to each other. You know, how does an album get into the world after we've recorded it? I mean, recording is just the 
just a sliver of the whole process. Right. You know, and when we look at that whole process from songwriting or, you know, I call it song collecting. If I'm working with an artist who doesn't have a song of their own, so we try to find songwriters, mm -hmm. collect material. So you start with that. Then you start with the pre-production phase where you decide what the album's going to be about. And, you know, it can't be avant-garde, funk, post-country, you know, <laughs> hip-hop, because no one will know what to do with it. Right. You know, so you have to decide a solid direction. You're going, am I rock? Am I hip-hop? Am I country? Am I pop? What am I doing? And then you record and mix. It's just a little tiny sliver in the step. Then the rest of the thing starts happening. We have to find out how to expose that product to the world. Is the artist doing live performances or not? Right. And... You know, the, then the whole journey begins. The recording is just this little sliver of the journey. So when we're talking about recording uh, at down at CPCC, the mm -hmm. program, how many classes are there in 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 the audio engineering? In the program? the whole sequence, we have four classes. Okay, and the class we were just talking about, audio one, is this. I call it, you know I like to call it audio boot camp. It basically just takes us from being green off the street, gives us a, a pretty good working knowledge of sort of the flow of the music industry in general. Also introduces us to all those core fundamentals of the gear that right. we're going to encounter, either in plugins or in a real in an analog studio. Okay. So that is where we start. Then there's Audio 1B. Audio 1B takes the, the very basic principles we learned in Audio 1, and it expands it. it. Does I call it the heavy lifting. We do all the math and science behind what we learned in Audio One, and a good chunk of that is things like acoustics and you know nature of sound and just all this stuff that at some point your boss is going to want you to know. Right. Um, then Audio Engineering Two is kind of this combination of a little bit of of technical training, mm -hmm. but mostly a practicum of what we've learned in Audio One. So this is where you know he, the instructor in that one, which I don't teach, John, will bring in bands and artists. They put them in the recording studio. We have our own recording studio on campus, okay. which is ours, and we don't share it with anybody else, so it's always available to our students you know, during Audio 2 to do what it is we do. But we bring artists in. They put microphones on it. They record them. They mix it down, and off it goes. And then the last class in the series at this point is Audio Engineering 3, which is in our computer lab. Uh, on Pro Tools, on the Pro Tools platform. And we have uh, 13 workstations. I only put 13 students in that class because we do not want anybody to have to share workstations. So when you sign up for Audio 3, you sit at your own Mac workstation. And we started day one and kind of spent a little bit of time because a lot of people have never been on a Mac before. So, okay. you know, class one kind of includes Mac operating system, how to get around in it. Then we dig directly into into Pro Tools, and by the time I've got you into like fifth or sixth week, we're doing like advanced mix down techniques. Okay, because a good chunk of what I do is I'm, I'm is a mix engineer. That's where I found my niche in audio engineering was to take a recording someone else had done and turn it into that final, you know, gem. Okay. So you know we focus on that pretty heavy, and by the time you're done, you know you know how to edit on Pro Tools, you know how to mix a song on Pro Tools where it sounds great. You know, it covers all, all the basics. So you got four classes. We got Audio 1, one B. Audio 1B, mm -hmm. Audio 2, two and, and Audio, audio 3. three. Uh, is there any prerequisite for taking other classes? Like people want to come in and they just wanted to sit down on Pro Tools. Um, so yeah, Audio 1, jump in post well, audio one is the, the portal for the rest of the program. So okay. you have to take Audio Engineering 1. And every semester, I have half a dozen students send me emails going like, well, I've had Pro Tools on my computer for two years, and I know everything and don't, shouldn't have to take one. And, you know, we've had an, an entrance exam, which at this point, I think I've given 35 or 40, and we've had one student pass it. Wow. So, you know, there's there's things that you do need to know that that are basic and theoretical, but trust me, it's not above your head. Yeah, um, there's a lot of stuff I've learned in there. I mean, I'm not by no means I'm an expert in Pro Tools. And I'm using an older version, but I mean they, they still work together, right? Um, but the class has opened up a lot of things I ne I never even thought about. Yeah, and that's the idea is to get your you know mind thinking about audio. Um, then audio engineering two, um, you have to pass one to get into audio engineering two, right? And audio engineering two can be taken along with one B during the same semester, and one B is a prerequisite 
to get into Audio 3. So you have to take Audio 1 and Audio 1B, and then we go into to Pro Tools. Okay. Our, um, our head of curriculum decided that because of kind of the nature of what I'm teaching in Audio 1B, he says, yeah, that, that really prepares the students for Audio 3. And he kind of felt, you know, especially the, the you know, four-hour discussion of signal flow and signal routing, he felt like was kind of <laughs> essential to knowing your way around Pro Tools. Okay. And that, you know, that's truly the, the difference between a professionally mixed product and a, an amateur product is how sound flows in, in and out of all the junk. And, you know, we the assumption is just because it's on a computer, it's easier. Right. You know, it's an easier method to record, easier way to do it. It's actually way more complex. Hmm. I mean, I, I put the gray, my little gray cells to work in Pro Tools a lot harder than I would in an analog studio. Hmm. You know, an analog studio is just, hey, hand me that cord and I plug this into this and go. And in Pro Tools, a lot of times I kind of have to stretch my, scratch my head and go, okay, now how am I going to make this happen? Yeah. So, you know, it's, it's all put together logically. And, and when the students get through it. I've never had a student say to me, yeah, I wasted my time in one, um, you know, or I wasted my time in three. And that, that's the goal of that's, you know, that's really my goal of being involved in program is making sure we're not, you know, we're giving valid, good information so that people walk away from it feeling like, you know, the, the money they've invested in the class was, was very well used. Yeah. The, the, the classes are interesting because there's, of course, you're getting the information from yourself, the instructor, but there's also a nice makeup of different folks in the class. And I had to laugh several times because I'm in my forties and there's some younger folks in the class and you'd be covering something and they have no idea what you're talking about. Right. It's amazing. And I remember we were talking about like, uh, using headphones and one of the guys listening was like, well, why would you even use headphones? Yeah, that's, that's crazy. In the mix, that... And he didn't understand, you know, well, you'd be in a separate room and and you need to hear your sound and you need to hear the mix. You can't just all be in yeah, the room. And that's the result them. of, you know, two decades of uh, of home recording kind of being the preferred method of recording. Yeah. Which, you know, is completely completely different than, you know, the real studio environment. So it's it's funny. I I get that, you know, and especially, you know, like you said we have people in their 40s and people in their 20s in the same class. So right. you get that that weird disconnect. And it's probably a different styles of, of music because I oh, remember yeah. uh, one of the fellows, he had asked, how do you record it? What's the best way to record a violin? Or um, I know there's a couple of students in the class, probably the one, one of the fellows we were talking about who asked about the headphones. He probably is not used to recording live instruments. He's probably used to doing just a lot of stuff right off a, a board. And maybe yeah, with, with MIDI you know, a lot of those like guys, especially the hip hop guys, are used to using nothing but what's built into their you know, laptops. Right. So they have synthesizers, they have samples, they have all this stuff built in their laptops, and, and they create their tracks without ever having to put a microphone on anything up until the point where they actually have to record the rap part. Right. So it's, it's kind of, it's pretty interesting. I mean, it's a, you know, an interesting dynamic, but it gives the students the opportunity with all these different people in the class to kind of learn, you know, let you kind of dip your hands into other genres that you might not be exposed to before. And if you're gonna if you're gonna be recording and and you're interested in recording, at, at I don't not even as a career but even as as a hobby, it's right. good to know different styles and different kinds of things to do, different miking techniques. How do you mic an amp? How do you mic a, yeah. a, a saxophone? Which I you know when you work a commercial studio, you don't know what your sessions are going to be. Right. And you know the whole goal of a commercial studio is to sell studio time. So. Your love might be hip hop, but tonight you may be recording a country band, and tomorrow you may have twenty five accordions in right. the studio. That's the local accordion ensemble that you get to record. And don't laugh, folks. I've done that. <laughs> My studios had twenty five accordion players in it at one time that we all recorded. If you want to make a living, it's not it's not always what you want. It's 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 who comes through yeah. the door that's and, going to pay the bills. You know, as an engineer, that that's the. The huge demand on on recording engineers is they have to know what these styles all sound like. You just can't be a great, you know, engineer that does only hip hop and suddenly have a country band walk through the door, right? And just because you're great at hip hop, immediately be great at country. You know, it requires like all this study. So, yeah. you know, the engineers that I've worked with and engineers that have worked for me, there's always been a oh well, you know. We know the session's coming up a week ahead, so if you need to sit down with a load of classical music and listen to classical guitar players, 
to know what a classical guitar is supposed to sound like in a solo environment, then that's what you do. So you're prepared. If you don't know how to put microphones on it, then you also will research that. Right. So a lot of it for the engineers themselves are making sure their technical chops are up to the up to, you know, what what needs to happen for the session as well as they're aware of what that music sounds like. Yeah. And these famous engineers like Bruce Swedeen that did the Beatles and Michael Jackson and a bunch of other people, they they all do that very commonly. I mean, you know, you could sit down with Bruce Swedeen and, and ask him about pop music today and he could tell you exactly right. how you would go about recording a pop album. Well, one of the things I found interesting, one of the nuggets that you tossed out in the class was we were just talking about recording different styles. So you were talking about, oh, well, if you're recording rock, you're recording with a click track. And if you don't know what a click track is and you're listening, a click track is, is basically a metronome beat that's set to however fast or slow you want the beat of the song to go. And every musician will be playing along with that click, 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 click. Yep. And then you, you we were talking about that and you said, but if you record a jazz band, you're not put on a click track. Right, yeah, a traditional swing swing jazz combo or small yeah. jazz combo, they work off of each other. Yeah. But typically in rock and pop, and even country, you know, you'll take a a song as it starts, and I've done this before because there's a there's a certain math and science to how the listeners want to, want a song presented. Right. Sometimes, you know, the the artist presents a song to you that may be five and a half minutes long, but you realize there's a three and a half minute version in there. Mm-hmm. And the click track helps us take pieces out. You know, maybe they have the bridge in the wrong place, so it allows me to pick up that bridge and move the bridge to the right location in the song and then put it all together so that when we play it top to bottom, it sounds like it was recorded that way. Yeah. And some really, really huge, huge albums have been done like that. I mean, Russia's Moving Pictures, they recorded Neil Peart's drum tracks against a click multiple times and then took and edited those together into the ideal drum track. Wow. Wow. And then they began putting the other stuff over it. Yeah, it, it, the digital world and digital recording is 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 so interesting because yeah. there's so much that can be manipulated. Well, in moving it. pictures, you know, instance they did with tape and a razor blade, so they were cutting the, they were cutting the tape <laughs> right. with a razor blade and taping right. it back together with a piece of scotch tape or something. You know, we call it editing tape, but it was you know basically looked like scotch tape. They weren't doing it in Pro Tools. No, they weren't doing it in Pro Tools. Pro Tools just makes it a little easier, a little quicker. Right. Um, gives you that safety net where that if you screw up, you know, realize in the analog world, if you screw up and, and you re-record over something, there ain't no going back. It's gone. Right. And Pro Tools gives us that, you know, one little safety net called undo. So if you, <laughs> so if you mess it up, you know, you can go back and press the undo button. You have another shot at it. Yeah. Or just record multiple takes of the same thing over and over yeah. and then just feedback. Listen. Grab it and grab it and move it around. And and all it's costing you is the price of the electricity. Right. Whereas if in, in um, tape world, <laughs> you you you're redoing the tape. Yeah, right? roll a two inch tape. You know, right now it's about two hundred and twenty five bucks a reel. Yeah. So you know that's that can be significant, and especially if it, you know you're running it at the the highest speed or the speed most studios run it at. You get about you know fifteen minutes of record time out of a reel of tape. Wow. So you know buying hard disks is definitely. Or, you know, flash drives to store to or other things like that are definitely a more cost effective way of going to to work on an album and, mm-hmm. and work on an album. And and that's an awful lot of pre production, you know, that figuring out what key the song needs to be in, what songs are right for the vocalist, mm-hmm. what kind of kind of that whole process that you go through when you, you know, find a new artist to work with or you're working with a new artist, that is, you know, almost always done in a small studio. You know, a lot of times a project studio or a studio that's like one step above a home studio or is mm-hmm. a home studio. So pre-production is a very important part of the whole album process. And a good chunk of time that happens in these smaller spaces. Now, uh, in at CPCC, I know we're talking about Pro Tools and mm-hmm. recording with digital. Do you guys do any analog recording at all or i know we talked well, about it in, audio, in audio engineering one. too yeah audio engineering too is set up as if it's an analog recording studio okay and the premise behind that is we have this big toft design console by malcolm toft uh 64 input great great sounding console um and that is going over to a 24 track recorder that is uh, at this point digital we don't have a two inch machine because it makes more sense for us to be able to do it digital but it's all run 
the same analog signal path that you would run as if you were using tape. Okay. And the idea behind that is all of our recording systems we have are based on a computer or a digital simulation of what a real recording studio or a you know commercial studio is. So when the guys designed Pro Tools, they said, oh, we need a mixer, we need a recorder, and now we got all these things that now we call plugins that are the little black boxes that sit in most people's racks. Right. And all of those were components that they took out of the, the studio. And same with the signal routing. The way the signal flows from one thing to another is is emulated from the analog recording studio. Hmm. So, you know, our discussions for quite a while have been based around, well, look, if you understand how a signal gets from A to B in an analog studio, you're going to understand what's going on in Pro Tools in a flash. If you expect to skip that process at all and don't understand, you know, how you know, how a sound gets from a guitar into a guitar amp through a bunch of stomp boxes, well, then if you don't understand that process, how do you ever expect to understand that process in Pro Tools? Right. You're trying to give a thorough education. It's not, hey, come in for the weekend and we're going to show yeah, you no, we're Pro not, Tools and you'll, and you'll become a um, Mutt Lang. Yeah, we're not a, you know, two weeks to become the ultimate, you know, recording engineer producer program. And, and that's, you know, sad to say there are programs out there now that they're more concerned about their student count. Right than what their students are learning. And that's us being a community college. Our our focus is more on the student experience. Right. And we talk about that a lot. You know, that's when we're thinking about, we have a piece of gear we were talking about taking out of the main studio now, which is a digital console. And our discussions were about, well, how is that going to affect the student experience? Mm-hmm. And so, you know, the digital console now remains because it's going to be incorporated next semester into Audio 1B. Because we were finding when we were talking to some of our students who had left the program that they were missing that little experience with a digital a digital console. Okay. So it's something we said, look, this is important. We should add this. You know, hmm. this is something that we have to fill in for their education is have them get some experience with a digital recording console. Um, to that end, we added a, a Control 24 in our Macintosh lab uh, for Pro Tools because it was important that we had a control surface right. for the students to at least have a tiny bit of experience with the control surface. So you guys have four classes now. Are How many did they have when the when you started? And when I started, we had three. All right. So we had the and, Audio and, B, 1B? Well, we had Audio 1, and we had one session of Audio Engineering 1. Okay. And we had uh, one session of Audio Engineering 2 and one session of Audio Engineering 3. And since I've since I've been there, we've had the student count go up in Audio Engineering One to the point where we added a second Audio Engineering One class, and then uh, two semesters ago, no, it's longer than that, like three semesters ago, uh, we had to add a second Audio Engineering Three class. Wow! So you know our our number of students are coming through are going up, and and that's good. Uh, this last summer we had summer classes, which uh, had Audio Engineering One, One B, and Three. And wow. the problem we had with two is is we could not figure out how to implement, you know, cramming 16 weeks right. in, down That's into the time. seven weeks that we have to do over summer session. However, the classroom, the, the classroom, you know, sessions that are less like a practicum were easy to do. You know, I, I just took whatever we were going to teach on, you know, Monday during the fall semester, for instance. We just taught both on Monday and Wednesday. You know, we took the weeks and just ding, 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 sure. stuck them into two days. So these four classes that we that are currently going on at CPCC, are these the four core classes where you just have different uh, times, right? Sessions of them going yeah, on. Yeah, we have just different times and sessions. So our audio engineering one classes are traditionally on Mondays during fall and spring semester. Okay. Audio engineering two is on Wednesday nights, usually at six o'clock, and and that goes on. Um, audio and engineering, audio engineering three, I'm sorry, is also on Wednesday nights at six. But when we have this semester, we didn't have a large enough, uh, amount of students to do both sessions, but usually we'll have a three thirty and a six o'clock session for that class. Okay. And then audio engineering two is on Tuesday evenings. And because a lot of people that, you know, are like yourself that, that you teach all day. Right. Or they have a job all day. You know, we've chosen to try to load our sessions towards the end of the day and do like six o'clock classes rather than, you know, it'd be very easy for us to do 10 a.m. classes, but that that's not going to help a lot of people get there because, right. you know, they, they have a life outside of 
yeah. coming to my class. And if it's continuing ed- education, I guess a lot of time it's it's folks who have been out of school and have a job and have other obligations. Yeah, and that's you know that's the big thing. It's like you know you don't have to just be fresh out of school, you know, because we've geared those classes so that if, if you're just jumping back into school after a long break, right, it's not that huge, you know, shock to your system that some people get, right. Yeah, in some classes I know, I mean, if I had to jump into a music theory class after being out of school for, you know, 15 <laughs> or 20 years, yeah, just that process of how we learn now and how the classes run now would be enough to, you know, kind of overwhelm, I think, most people. So what's coming down the pike for the program? Do you have any uh, anything that you guys are talking about doing? Yeah, we're we're talking about quite a bit of stuff at this point. A lot of it just talk at this point, but we are okay. we are looking at, you know, our our ideal is to expand the program where necessary and and when we find a reason to expand it you know we just we just don't want to expand just for the pure sake of saying hey we got a new class right so you know spend your money come and waste an entire semester with me i'm not really going to teach you anything but you know hey you get to play with the gear it's, it's got to you know some we, value. we want some teeth to it something that's going to improve your abilities as a recording engineer you know, improve your chances of, of getting music into the world if necessary and things like that. So, it, you know, whatever we do is going to going to be something that that fits. Well, I can attest. I mean, in, in taking audio right now, audio number one, it's a lot of information. Yeah, it's it a is. a lot of stuff. And like anything else, you get out of it what you what you put in. So if you're just kind of like, you know, brushing certain things aside, well, you know, you're not going to learn anything about it. But if you're open to expanding what you know, man, there's a lot of stuff. Yeah, there is. It's it's quite a bit. And I, I've spent quite a few semesters. When I first came in, we had a textbook that was okay. And we're in, you know, the next kind of um, version of it. I think we're like three versions down since I started teaching. But part of what I did was looked at that book and said, okay, look, I can either bring in a $250 textbook or I can bring in this textbook that's basically 40 bucks. Yeah. And look at what's in the textbook and say, look, it's kind of shy here. It's kind of shy there. So we'll just add that material to it. So, you know, my focus has been on getting the students that come through that class, the the correct information we need to grow as a a recordist or audio engineer. Right. And then um, the book is kind of like this safety net where, you know, it has some information maybe we didn't present in the class. There's Mm -hmm. other info we'll use out of that book for audio engineering 1B. So, you know, my goal has always been to give the students as good of an experience as I could give them and as complete as possible. Maybe not traditionally exactly the same way that you get, you know, at App State or someplace like that. But right. at the same point, I think, you know, most people walk out and I've had students who've left our program and gone to App State. I've also had students who've gone to uh, Musicians Institute in Southern California and obviously Full Sail, which a lot of guys do. And every one of them have told me the same thing. They go, yeah, yeah man, I sailed through my first semester there because of Audio One. So to me, that's a huge testament to saying, okay, I'm, I managed to get what we're teaching down to the good essential stuff that, you know, gives people a good background so that, you know, they can basically have almost a semester off when they go to another school. No, yeah, no. I mean, there's a lot of stuff in there. And, so. you know, in the industry, the thing that needs to expand at this point is, is internships are hard to come by. You know, if you just graduated a recording school, getting a getting an internship in a recording studio because they're, you know, kind of way fewer than there used to be, and especially ones who pay, is become really tough. So, you know, I think the schools that teach this, it's it's almost gonna become their responsibility in the next few years to to provide that internship experience. Mm-hmm. So, you know, if our program expands, that's one potential direction it could expand to. But, you know, realize that, that you know, if you're a guy who's never been in a recording studio, never paid an hour of time in a recording studio, and you're just doing all your recordings at home, and you expect to, to get a job working as an engineer and quitting what you're doing now, you probably need to find you and about 100 other guys to go be patrons of recording commercial recording studios. So there are some there when you want to try and find a gig. <laughs> Right. Because if everybody records at home, we're going to have a whole bunch of educated guys that do nothing but sit at their house and wish that they could, you know, bring clients in and record. 
Yeah, and, and a lot of people are doing recording yeah. studios in their ha- home on the side. No, I'm only charging 25 an hour and this and that. I, I mean, I don't know. I don't know what the quality is like from, from some folks. It could be high. It could be low. I, I don't know. Well, you know, houses are built for living and recording studios are built for recording. There you go. So, you know, if you're ever in, if you've never been in, if you've never done a session in a real studio, treat yourself to it just once. And, you know, they're, it, it, it's a huge weight off your shoulders to not have to think about pushing buttons while you're playing. You know, suddenly the creative side is set free to do what the creative side wants to do. And and the it's exceptional. I mean, it's a great experience. I mean It's a different experience. Yeah. I've had the I've had the good fortune to, you know, stand in the same spot that, you know, Chris Squire and, you know, Elton John and people like that were on the other side of the glass. So I've been in the same studios they recorded in. And it's always just an amazing feeling when you walk into a studio where you know this art stuff's gone on. Wow. And, you know, it's cool. It's starting to turn around again because we have studios that are now reopening. Uh, Reflection Sound, which had been here in Charlotte forever, had, you know, I mean, gold records and platinum records hanging on the walls from artists they had worked with, including doing James Brown's last four or five albums there, that he's reopened in a new location. Mm -hmm. And that's kind of the trend that's going on now. You know, the record plant in Sausalito just reopened. And the enterprises is, is said that they're about to reopen again in, in Southern California. So the recording studio industry is beginning to make a rebound, which is good news for anybody that wants to be, you know, work in the industry. Sure. And I think as a result, what it's going to do is is bring that that level up. You know, the the quality of recordings are going to go up also because you have somebody working at the helm who does this six days a week, five days a week. You know, he puts fifty or sixty hours in a week recording sound sure and that kind of experience is really hard to duplicate on your own when you're recording yourself it's just like being a musician in that sense you could go to school for music but when you come out it's you know yeah nobody being in tells the you what to do it. yeah nobody tells you what to do and then i imagine being an audio engineer is the same thing if you can't find a job you're kind of forced and left to your own devices to figure out how you're going to make a living doing it because a lot of schools in mu- for music, if you're going, they don't have a business program. Right. And today, it's almost like the Wild West. You have to figure out websites and all these kind of things in yourself. Yeah. So, and I mean, really, that's you know, I would encourage everybody to take even just a basic business course if you plan on being in the business because it's just, you know, I mean, I get contracts half the time I work on anything. There's a contract involved in it, right? And you know, it's it, it's nice in one respect because you always know what's expected of you and you know what to expect of the people you're working for. But, you know, when it's, once it hits 15, 16 pages, yeah. you know, you probably, you know, need to bring in some professional help most of the time, which I do, but, or have enough, you know, business background so that you can kind of sort through that and say, oh, I, okay, I get this. This was in this other contract. This was in this one. Yep. But, you know, a little basic business knowledge will really help, help your career, you know, move forward kind of in the right way. And that's what I was saying earlier when we were talking about the class, just audio one, you drop these nuggets about re- real world experience. And if people don't understand, it's not music, it's the music business. And if you want to make money and be able to support yourself, you, you can't just play music. You've got to understand the business aspect of it. And there's a, uh, interpersonal relationships that go on and, and, and talking to people and your knowledge is just, it's just going to be time in and, yes. and learning. Yeah. It's a, uh... It's it's kind of a, a crazy business, but I think, you know, a, any business you go into has those has their own quirks. Right. It's just, you know, a lot of people view the music industry as being the easy way. You know, they're <laughs> like, you know, I mean, they look at it and they go, like, oh, this is the easy way to, to get in, you know, to, ha- to have a career. And I was watching, um, I was watching uh, college baseball when they had the college baseball World Series. And the announcers said this thing that, you know, absolutely floored me. They say, well, you know. Only 1% of these young men are going to have a career in sports after college. I was like, oh, crap, I'll take that every day of the week because you know, the music <laughs> industry is one-tenth of 1%. Yeah. So, you know, I'll take those odds any day. <laughs> so, you know, it's really, it's, it's really about making yourself, you know, as good as you can be because there are a lot of very mediocre talents out there, a lot of very mediocre recordings, a lot of very mediocre people so if you're one of those that strives to be really good and make really good recordings 
that that loads the dice in your favor a little bit to begin with. And you know, it is kind of a game of luck. I mean, you know, it there there is a little bit of luck factored into it because I'm I know sure. so many astounding musicians that even though they they did all the steps just never got there. But today, you know, it's it's everything. You, yeah. you like we were just talking about, it. you've got to have the you got to be able to play. You got to be able to write a song. You've got to be able to put the business part together. You got to be able to talk to people and being a musician. And maybe it was this always this way. I don't know, but you have to have a lot of different things to get where you're at. It's, it's not just pure, pure yeah. luck. And I don't think anybody ever got rich and famous and sold lots of albums being able to move. Yeah, their just fingers on pure quick. luck. Yeah. It's it, like that it saying overnight happen. sensation takes about three years to happen. Yeah. And, you know, a lot of people don't don't want to, you know, they're not patient enough to work that whole thing. But, you know, think think about this. You know, you invest three years of your time in your life, and then on the other end of the thing, you have a career. Yeah. And it's, you know, my, my dad was a military man, and, you know, he always said the guys who went to the academies, they work for four years to play the rest of their lives, and the rest of us play for four years and work for the rest of our lives in college. <laughs> so you know it's it, and that that's kind of he you know he always said those kind of things and as I got older I started thinking about it. I was like going yeah you know my my dad was really dead on about that because if you invest your time at some point you know you have to to put your heart into it invest your time in it work at it and then be patient you know if you put everything in play right you know covered all the bases then you know that that puts you in a good position for something to happen but if you give up you know, five minutes before the phone before the phone rings, or you know, the guy gets out to see you from this company or that company, then you know you've you know it's not been all for naught. Yeah. Well, we're going to wrap things up, Dan. Is all there right. anything you want to add about the the, the program at, at CPCC? Well, we got um, next semester is going to start in January. Okay. And so we'll finish up right before you know everything gets really warm and it's time for summer vacations. So you know, if you if you're interested in learning some about recording, please come out and please come out and see us. It starts up in what January? Uh, I believe it's second week of January. Second week of January. I believe so. Awesome. And um, you know, the thing about Central Piedmont Community College is that they will ask you to become a student. However, you know, basically, you don't have to do a lot to get there. So, you know, because we are continuing ed. I mean, you know, if you want to take the class, there should be nothing standing in your way to take that class. Yeah, I'll give it my full endorsement. I'm really enjoying myself taking it. Well, great. Great. Well, thanks again, Dan. I All really right. appreciate you coming on. All right. Have a great day. We'll see you. Bye. Bye. And that'll bring episode four of the Queen City Music Podcast to a close. Until next month, take care. Take care.